I didn't want you to suffer. But the time for that is long past. Is this really what you desire? Well, I already know the answer. Let us continue until the world meets its end. You ever hear someone say that they listened to a song or played a game and it changed their life? Like they found some sort of new hope from this one piece of media. I mean, I can get how these things can affect people and change the way they view the world, but for me, it never really clicked. Like you hear something about dark souls saving people's lives and that it taught them to never back down and to always go forward. But whenever I played Elden Ring or Bloodborne, I never really thought of it that way. And it's not that I thought these games were easy or I never struggled with them. Orphan of Cause, Melania, those two kicked my ass and right after I beat them, I cheered happily with my body all beaten up. Point is, I never got that feeling of truly learning something from a type of media. That is, until now. Introducing Persona 3 Reload. Now my experiences with Persona are not very vast. I didn't play the original Persona 3, and the only game I did play in the series is Persona 5. However, I never finished it. Okay, wait, wait, oh, ah, Jesus Christ, okay, ah. I didn't finish Persona 5 because it was a bad game. I didn't finish it because of one, my goopy goblin brain at the time, and two, Atlas went on to make a better version of the one I had, Persona 5 Royal. So when I first bought the game, I was in the phase where I only played online games, and I really wanted a way out. So I bought it, played it, and yeah, my brain was sleeping the entire time. The furthest I got was getting through Kamashita and just starting on the, uh, the painter guy, and that was the furthest I went. So skip to a couple years later after Persona 5 Royal releases, and I've also finally gotten out of my multiplayer phase. I'm free! I try the game again, and restart. But as I try the game out, I slowly realize, wait, there's like a better version of this game out right now that not only has a new character who had the entire internet in a chokehold, by the way, but also has way more content. And it wasn't like a expansion pass for the original. This was basically the original game, but with new content added onto it. So if I finish the original game and then buy Royal, then I would have to play through a good majority at least of the game in order to experience the new stuff. And for me personally, Persona isn't a game that I would replay. It's one of those unreplayable games for me. And that's mostly the gist of how my first experience with Persona was. But there are aspects that I do like about the game. Persona 5's gameplay and story in the beginning was actually really entertaining. The plot, characters, and gameplay was interesting. Well, except for the combat. Combat and exploration in the beginning was just something that I was very put off on. At first I was like, oh cool, each enemy in Persona has their own strengths and weaknesses. And then you get all out attacks introduced and you're like, damn, this shit is good. And then you add the theme on top of it and you're just like, damn, this is good. <laughs> However, I reached a point, and this could totally be a problem with how I was playing at the time, but there was a period of me having to fight an enemy, where I get into a fight, target their weaknesses, and then unleash an all-out attack. And that would just repeat over and over again. Now the good thing about Persona 5 was that the other stuff in the game was so good that I managed to complete the prologue. It was like playing Life 2, but life was actually enjoyable. And the thing that was the most exciting part for me was the option of choice. There is so much you are given in the city, but each thing can only be done once per day, or on certain days. So you had to strategize on what the best option would be right now. Do you want to hang out with a friend to increase your rank with them, or eat a giant burger to increase your courage so that you can talk to your crush? And thankfully, the work and school parts are so short, which holy fuck, I wish it was real. These were the parts that I clicked with. And to those who chose to get groomed by the teacher, how dare you? Honestly when there was a way better option right in front of you. Granted, I'm assuming I met a fraction of the cast, but hot goth woman who supplies you with drugs is hard to beat, please help me. Lastly, the thing that amazed me the most, and was probably my favorite thing, was the style and music of the game. It was mesmerizing going through the menu and listening to the tracks. The Persona series in general has one of the best HUDs in gaming, period. It's just so cool to look at, and immediately tells you, yeah, this game was made with passion. 
So basically, Persona 5 wasn't a bad game, I was just really stupid. Either way, I never finished the game, so why did I try out Persona 3 Reload? I have a half dumb reason and half good reason. One, I just want to try out a Persona game, see if I really did mature with story games. Since I've played my fair share of solo games, and I want to test myself to see if I can get through an RPG. And what would be better than a Persona game? One of the most appealing RPGs out there. And now the done reason. Bro, look at this. Come on. This looks sick as hell. Yeah, I saw the cover art and thought, That looks fucking sick, I'm, I wanna buy this. Also the title, Persona 3 Reload. Doesn't that sound cool as hell? We need more wordplays on Remastered. Reload is way cooler than Remastered, especially with the context of guns being used in the game a lot. So basically, the dumb reason is the truth on why I want to play it, and the good reason is the justification for it. So, I spent over 60 hours on the game and went on to finish it. And yeah, I can safely say, this game is life-changing. Now, I'm not going to talk about the entire story about the game like I did with Dredge. That would be a 48 hour long video, and I don't think anyone has the attention span for that. Especially me editing it. Are you ready for my two hour long video? <sighs> uh... I really just want to talk about my experience and try to explain why this game made me feel something that I've never really felt before in a game. If you don't want any spoilers on the story at all, uh, why, why are you watching this still, first off? Second, play the game. You should play Persona 3. Now! If you have any interest in playing the game, even if you have goopy goblin brain like I do, play it. Because the way the gameplay grows was surprisingly fast and addicting. Now if you refuse, that's fine. It is a long commitment to a game. The game does have a lot of heavy topics shoved into it, and the Persona series does not really hold back with this stuff, and this one is no exception. So if you do have any triggers for like any heavy topics like these, then yeah, I don't really suggest playing the game. Anyway, before we get to the menu screen, there's this really cool opening which shows all the main cast. The Persona series isn't shy to an anime opening to introduce you to the game, and this one is great, especially the music. I don't know if I can play it, but it's called Full Moon, Full Life, and the drop that it has, especially when the MC just, well, you know. It's just like, it just hits you with that, holy shit, this is gonna be a banger. It definitely turned down my worries on whether or not the game was gonna be interesting or not. And then the menu, which, god damn. I know I've talked about the menus in the Persona series, but Persona 3 is by far my favorite aesthetic. The vibrant blue colors with the clear white text is just so appealing to look at. And the pause menu having this underwater feel to it. Oh my god. Seeing the MC change in every part of it, drifting across the menu. <laughs> it's just so beautiful, man. Oh god, I actually, I actually got teary-eyed from that. Holy shit. Alright, enough glazing the UI menus. You can watch like a ton of videos on that. Let's get into why this game was so good to me. Yes, I chose normal. Go fuck yourself. Unlike Persona 5, in Persona 3, there's already an established group who has the ability to wield Personas. In 5, oh. Morgana was the only one with any knowledge about them. No one else besides him knew about Personas. But in this game, a whole company is aware of them, and is trying to put a stop to the shadows. It surprised me, considering that this was the third game in the series. You would expect this kind of concept to be in the later games than the early ones. The start is actually kind of slow, with you just traversing the school and town, and getting used to everything and then it slowly trickled in that there's more than what's being let on. I mean, obviously there was, but the hints were still there. Slight spoiler alert, even though it's revealed in the opening and also a little after the incident that happens in the beginning, but Junpei also arrives here. In the fifth game, a character would have this arc for them to awaken their persona. They would need to realize something within themselves to unlock this power. But in this game, they just go, there's no buildup to them awakening their personas really, or even introducing new characters. 
The only one I can really think of is like Fuka. Is that the Grim Reaper? Most of them usually just show up and they're ready to throw down immediately. Like they see a dog take down a shadow and they're just like, oh shit, let's put him on the team. It goes from slightly slow build up and then just ramps up the pace. And I don't really mind it that much. Yeah, the characters don't have this cool character building moment, but truth be told, they don't need it. Because these characters are built so well throughout the story. Throughout the game, you get these cutscenes to see what they're doing right now, and see how they're going about their day. Some meet new people, some reconcile, and some confront others. This dog right here is better than like 70% of characters in video games. And then the gameplay itself, with building relationships and prioritizing what you need currently. There's not much of a difference between Persona 3 and 5, so my thoughts stay the same for that. Combat, however, oh my god. I remember right when I was getting bored with the combat, they introduced Thurgis, this cool special power up characters can do. Not only were the animations cool, but also provided that little boost for me enjoying the combat more. Now I want to see everyone's Thurgy, and right after I did that, another character would be introduced. And that's when the fast pacing really worked for me. I was rarely bored with combat since there was either a new mechanic or character introduced. And then when everything was revealed, you could start making your builds better. Like making Junpei into a crit demon. This man was a monster in my place. It was really fun, and the times where I didn't want to do the combat, I just didn't. And that's a legitimate difference I can make between Persona 3 and 5. I didn't like how exploration was required for Persona 5 to finish a story arc, since you would need to reach a part of the area to continue the story. Tartarus, on the other hand, was a lot more simple. You just need to reach this certain floor, and you can easily just run past enemies and get there. Listen, the goopy goblin brain doesn't just go away. And when I have limited time to search through an area or else the game is over, and also the combat is mid at the same time, then I'm not going to enjoy getting through the game that much. Now on to my two favorite things about the story, and uh, I'll save the existential one for the end. Yeah, you can date her, by the way. My favorite part of this whole game was the characters. The main cast, to be exact. Oh, I, I never did that. Uh... Aw, oh, shit. Side characters, really good. What you're about to listen to is the original take that I had after messing up. I'll only talk about the ones that I maxed out. Uh, Miyamoto, his story was really, really just inspiring, interesting. I really liked how he matured. You know, he put off this selfish act and decided to act more selfless. Now, as you can tell, that sounded like shit. I, I didn't like that. So I'm going to redo it with a proper mind. I am going to keep uh, two characters. No, I'll keep one. I'll keep one character because I had a revelation discussing the character. And I'm, I'm, you'll be able to hear it. You'll definitely be able to hear it. So, uh, yeah. Miyamoto was a very, uh, he was a cool character. His arc was really just going from selfless to actually being selfless. Because his original goal was to win the Nationals so that his nephew could take up walking. But he ends up discovering that his knee is in a bad spot and anyone running can really seriously injure it permanently. And throughout his social link, he constantly tries to hide it from his team, but they eventually find out. And instead of pushing him away as a burden, they instead support him, but also make sure he doesn't go too far. And it's with this that he's realized that he's actually been selfish the entire time, with him not trusting his team, and also figures out that him helping his nephew was really just an excuse to try and win. So he decides to get surgery, which makes him unable to play the Nationals, but save his knee. Overall, good story. I like how it goes from, you know, a character learning from their mistakes and maturing. There is obviously better versions of this in the game, and especially in the main cast, but it's it's good. There's a trend within these characters to notice that their actions are actually pretty selfish. So instead, they learn and mature, and really just become better people overall, thanks to you talking to them. And I like it. It's nice. 
like Maiko, who is a little girl whose parents are going through a divorce. And it's pretty tragic to view a child in the middle of that, and really see how it affects a kid. She tries to run away because of this, and this of course makes her parents worried sick. So they end up telling her why they're getting a divorce, and it's simply because they don't love each other anymore. Which Maiko finds hard to accept, but ultimately understands. So now she has to choose who to stay with. Which is a pretty daunting decision for a child to make by the way. They're essentially dealing with adult topics at a very young age, and it can affect them pretty badly. So she ends up going with her mom, and also wants a promise to marry us in the future, so now we are classified as a groomer. And now we have Maya, who is a gamer girl that I honestly didn't care about until I connected the dots and realized, wait, this is Miss Toriyumi, one of our teachers. I'm a teacher, and you're my student. I also fucking hate the way she talks and can barely understand her. And she reveals some very, uh, not good stuff. And when she finds out that we were the ones she was talking to, it turns into the funniest cutscene in the game. No, no, no! <laughs> also, she invites us to dinner, so... She's not off the table yet, boys! Anyway, uh, Maya, uh, she notices that she's a bitch, so she decides to... Oh yeah, the game, like, shuts down and... It's the same thing, bro, it's the same thing, alright? The, the cutscene at the end is the only reason you do this, alright? That cutscene made the whole thing worth it, but other than that, I didn't give a fuck about it, alright? Maya mid. Except for that last cutscene. Uh, Bebe. Bebe was my favorite side character. The foreign exchange student who is just like, just says Japanese phrases constantly was fucking hilarious to me. Red bean is so oishi! Also, his like, story is really sad too, with his aunt dying, and then him also having the Miyamoto effect of just like, deciding to be selfless in the end and choose to help the people around him that helped him get to Japan in the first place instead of just abandoning them. But he still promises to make his way to Japan and eventually reunite with us. Well, um... Uh... Oh my fu- holy shit, dude. Wow. Wow. Oh my god, this- this game is so sad, holy shit. I'm so sorry, baby. Anyway, let's get back to the main cast. I just want to focus on these guys because they were the highlight of the game. I'll also be talking majorly in detail for my top three because uh, I don't want to extend the video that long. And I'll briefly talk about the others though. First, with my favorite character, Junpei. Junpei is this goofball who on the surface appears to be this cheerful, outgoing dude, but in reality is a guy with a lot of issues with himself and has a major inferiority complex. At first, he's an asshole at times because he's jealous and doesn't feel worthy to be someone respected. It also doesn't really help that he has a constant hater on his ass too. Plus, the dude desperately wants a lover as well. But he grows throughout the story by just thinking to himself about these issues. He finally has a purpose, which is stopping the dark hour. But then he falls back down as he freezes up again by realizing that if the dark hour is gone, he wouldn't be special anymore. Junpei's main issue in the game is the feeling of not having much to live for. And then he meets Chidori, this goth girl who he ends up befriending. And their whole, like, story arc is just so sad, but also really heartwarming. And it's with this meeting that he's able to finally talk to someone about his insecurities, which leads to him even opening up to us about it. And slowly, he goes from this nice guy who shows you around the place, to this bitter person who's jealous to you, to someone who's realized the mistakes he's made and wants to improve on himself. One of my favorite moments is when he lashes out at us for a certain other problem that he blames on us. Obviously, what he's doing here is just wrong, but what makes this different compared to other times is that he apologizes to us a couple seconds later. Unlike before, where he would need a couple days at least to really sit and think about it, he realizes on the spot what he says isn't actually what he thinks and took it too far. He was just scared. And it's great because it shows that even though Junpei has grown so much throughout the game, he still has his off moments. Because those are just mistakes people make at times. He doesn't have this dramatic change and is suddenly a different character entirely. From beginning to end, Junpei is still himself. Just a little more grown. Also, his whole arc is just depressing to look at. Especially for someone like me, since I can definitely relate to what he's feeling. I love Junpei. 
He's a great character, and he's definitely in my top 10 of all time. Now then, on to my second favorite, and it's honestly really hard to choose. Junpei is my de facto number one, but there are two people that come to mind that I'm really struggling as my second favorite. And I think it's gotta be Shinjiro Aragaki, or Shinji. Okay, major spoilers for this. Like, major, major. So if you want to skip this part and don't want to be spoiled, just go to this timestamp. Then again, this whole video is like full of spoilers. Shinji is the character with the shortest amount of time you can have with them. But for me, he was one of the most impactful, if not the most impactful. Shinji's character is essentially the tough guy who actually has a really sweet heart. It's nowhere near as complex as Junpei's character, but it's just this simplistic part of his character that I really enjoy. It genuinely felt like his tough nature was slowly being peeled off whenever you hung out with him. And then you realize he's just a chill guy. Even though he has this brash and rough attitude, he really puts in his effort to give you advice about things. Plus his arc, while being really short, was also really emotional. Especially with his promise to Sonata and Mitsuru. And also, we can't forget his death. Shinji's death with him telling Amada that no matter how painful life gets, you just gotta stick through it, hits hard. Especially before dying, his immense guilt of accidentally killing Amada's mother has forever haunted him, to the point of him taking suppressants so that his persona never freaks out again, with the price being his life. And then you realize that the only reason why the advice he gave was so genuine was because he was going to end up dead soon. Shinji's character is a tragedy that led to the main cast to grow and be better, and the effect of Shinji goes on throughout the entire game. It gives characters deaths weight and also shows the danger of not only Strega, but also the danger that everyone in the group faces. And that is death. Um, uh... So, my next favorite character is the best girl of the game, of course, Yukari. I guess. I feel so bad for Yukari since she was my favorite female character throughout the game until Aegis decided to shove her off the spot. Aegis really did come out of nowhere and suddenly gave you the most emotional parts of the game. I really adore the concept of machines becoming more human, and it's done amazingly here. Aegis' story is basically her accepting the life she's been given, but also the end of others. Throughout the game, she's just there, basically being a comedy tool and also to translate Koromar. And only until the end does Aegis actually become an interesting character. I mean, you're given little hints here and there about her becoming more emotional. Other than that, it's not really reinforced until the end. But man, the impact it had on the game, especially the last cutscene, which, uh, yeah, I have not recovered yet. I honestly thought about skipping Aegis' story, but I'm thankful I wasn't dumb enough to do that. Seeing Aegis decide that her purpose to live would be cherishing her memories of Team C's was really heartwarming to see. She really did a 180 on my emotions. And it's really tragic because it's the thought that everyone she knows will disappear one day. And as sad as that is, it makes life that more valuable. Oh, oh shit, uh, um. So the other characters are pretty cool, am I right? Sonata is the cool strong guy who actually has a lot of shit going on within himself. Someone with a lot of trauma, but uses it to strengthen himself instead of running away from it. <laughs> I did it, Miki. Oh. <laughs> Meanwhile, Yukari is the exact opposite. Most of the game is just her not knowing how to help, or even knowing if she wants to help defeat the shadows. Constantly unsure of what she wants to do at the moment. If you think about it, it's the complete opposite of Junpei's problem where he didn't know what to do in the future. The flip being that Yukari doesn't know what to do in the present. She's also Junpei's number one hater. More like stupid, he's defective. Say it again, say it to my fucking face. Mitsuru is the rich girl who is deeply connected with the backstory of the shadows and is also the heir to the company who caused this whole mess in the first place. At first, I really didn't care about her that much, but then I once again maxed her her social rank and it completely changed my view on her. I really did that a lot, huh? She feels a ton of pressure being the heir of the Kiriju group and also has a lot of trouble with her freedom, struggling to choose between work and time for herself. So instead, she chooses to not run away, but also care for herself and her freedom. When this is all over, let's take this motorcycle and go on a trip somewhere together. Koromaru, I love because he's such a good boy, but also his story is pretty sad, honestly. He has no one to return to once everything is over, and constantly hangs out near areas where his previous owner was. And he feels a lot of guilt not being able to move on from this. And once he decides he's ready, he chooses to stick with us for the rest of his life. Which makes the ending hit even harder, oh my god. This is all for a dog, by the way. 
We need more good animal characters. There's not enough. Fuka struggles with her confidence in wanting to prove herself, as well as reconnecting with those who've wronged you in the past. Yukari's story also touches in on this with her mom, but I didn't want to mention it twice. And finally, Amada. Um... I mean, it's alright, like... I think in terms of writing, he's the weakest character, and that mostly is because he's a child. I do like the direction of him finding a reason to continue living, but I also wish they leaned more on him accepting his kid's side rather than trying to seem more mature. Either way, that's like one character out of the main cast that I feel mad towards. Anyway, here's my tier list on the characters in terms of story. I will not be having any arguments about this unless you respond with a hour long video, which your response is dead to me anyway. In the face of unavoidable disaster, lies the opportunity to search for redemption. Oh fuck. Okay, okay, okay. I get it. Let's finally talk about my true favorite part of the story, even though I already said that, and I fucked up on the writing, but th this is the this is the part that I really like, alright? This this right here. It's really good. Trust me, stay. I need you to stay. Let's finally talk about my other favorite part of the story. Beyond the journey you have taken lies the absolute end. It matters not who you are. One thing is always certain. Death awaits all. This part will pretty much spoil the end game, so if you want to click off, uh, subscribe, please don't leave me. So after the first half of the game, the cast have this revelation that they haven't actually gotten rid of the Dark Hour at all. In fact, they might have released the end of everything. They don't know this yet, and it's only told ambigu ambiguously? Ambiguously. By Ikutsuki. Which, by the way, I didn't like this portrayal. It just felt really random for a character to go from telling shitty jokes to wanting to end the world. It's probably the worst part of the story by far, but thankfully, it doesn't go near this low ever again. After a couple of months, there's this new transfer student who is really, really sus. Right off the bat, Aegis says he's dangerous. And he also appears after Ikutsuki says that the 12 shadows have merged into one being. He also also appears after Pharaoh says goodbye and has a very similar speech pattern to him. Yeah, so this guy's the bringer of the end. Now after being the shit off Aegis by literally standing still. Now what the hell is this? Man, if you don't cut that shit out. He brings the group news that the end is coming, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. Death will soon take its form as a being called Nyx, and cause the fall, rendering everyone basically dead. Obviously, everyone is shook about this, and they all have an existential crisis about it. And it gets even worse, with Ryoji seeing that there is a way for this to be painless. And that's to kill him, so that they won't know the end is coming, and forget everything about the Dark Hour. Afterwards, he gives them a month to decide what choice they'll pick. So now, everyone has the option of either living with the dread of knowing that the end is coming for everyone, and supposedly there's no way to stop it either, or live in blissful ignorance and not know anything but still be taken by the fall. Oh yeah, forgot to mention, because they forget everything in the dark hour, that means they'll forget every moment with Team C's, which means the whole group basically falls apart. As you can expect, the group doesn't really take well to this, wondering if anything they did even mattered. All their choices, trauma, relationships, every growth they made, it was pretty much all for nothing. They're rightfully terrified of the end, but also don't want to forget the memories they all made together. So throughout the month, they think, and most importantly, they talk. They talk and discuss the situation and eventually come to a conclusion. And they decide, it's better to live proud with the memories you have than to accept the end and run away. Which, goddamn, that is cheesy, but oh my god. Damn, that hit the spot. So, they decide to fight. Even against an unstoppable force, they believe in the small chance that they can defy fate and win. Well, unless you kill Ryoji, which, uh, you fucking idiot. It's this beautiful moment where it makes you appreciate these characters even more. This situation that has brought them so much despair has instead brought them closer. Yes, they're scared. 
but they have each other backing them up. It's literally the power of friendship, but in the best way possible. It's beautiful. That's all I can really say about it. Anyway, with the decision made, the day finally comes to confront Nyx. And the boss not only has a banger as a theme, but also is really annoying. Yes, the Arcana is the means by which all is revealed. The Arcana is the means by which all is revealed. The Arcana is the means by which all is revealed. The Arcana is the means by which all is revealed. Anyway, it's unbeatable. They try all their might, but it's no use. Death is inevitable. But Makoto, the MC, decides, man, fuck that shit, and uses the power of friendship to gain the power of the universe. Call this a deus ex machina? I don't care, this is still cool as hell. Using the power to seal death away and preventing the fall. Now sadly, with the fall gone, that means the dark hour will be too. So their memories will also vanish. But they all promised to each other that on graduation day for the third years, they would meet on the school rooftop to reunite and remember. And so, the day comes. Makoto doesn't feel very well, and Igis decides to escort him onto the roof, remembering everything with no problem because she's a machine. As they wait for everyone to eventually arrive, Igis tells Makoto about her life changing and the meaning of life itself, her meaning, how everyone's experience has changed her, how you changed her, how even small relationships can impact greatly in someone's life, how it doesn't need to be complex, it just needs to be lived with some kind of purpose, to have friends, to find love, to enjoy yourself, to enjoy other things, as long as you find some sort of happiness in life. That's enough to have meaning. And as Igis tells Makoto her meaning, she says that we can rest too. Death is an inevitable thing. And as we sealed away Nyx, it took our life to do it. And just to take a break from all the sad stuff, even though I'm still tearing up, I really respect the devs for making this decision. Even if Makoto saved the world, it not only costed him his life, but also doesn't stop death. Because you can't. The end will happen to everyone no matter what. Even someone like Makoto, this being who was able to harness the power of the universe, couldn't escape it. So instead, he rests on Igis' lap, and as everyone finally makes it onto the roof, he sleeps. It's such a bittersweet ending and made me cry. I'm not gonna lie, it made me cry. I didn't bawl my eyes, but my eyes were definitely water. And I haven't cried genuinely in such a long time. Not because I'm some sort of stone mask that won't shed tears. I just hated crying as a kid and conditioned myself to not do it. Which I regret, but hey, this game proved me wrong. Death to me is this terrifying but calming force of nature. It makes us cherish every moment we have, and I remember thinking about death as a kid and it really terrified me, to the point where I couldn't even sleep. I thought to myself, do I go to heaven? Is there some sort of afterlife? Is there even a hell? Or is there just nothing? I was pretty much traumatizing myself, but nowadays I'm a lot more comfortable about death. This game has really reinforced my ideals of changing or deciding to move on, and I've decided to go back to college, try film and I have no idea what my future holds. Much like Junpei trying basketball, basketball, why did I say, <laughs> not basketball, <laughs> baseball. Much like Junpei trying baseball again, I don't know what result will happen, but it's something I wanna try. 
I'm not sure if the experience will be positive or negative, but I can only hope and move forward. I want to thank you for watching this video, and all I'll say is I hope you subscribe and look forward to my content. And also, thank you Atlas for making Persona 3 Reload. But also fuck you for making the expansion $35. $35! And it's not even in the complete version. Like, if you count the original price without it going on sale, which I bought on sale by the way, it, that is like $100, near $100. Like, what the hell is that? I'll go fuck yourself.